And now I'm going to pass over to Pablo. Pablo, you probably know, he's one of the uh, core developers. He's uh, the release manager for Python 3.10. And he's also a member of the steering council that basically decides where Python is going in the next, uh, well, the steering council is voted for every year, but it's basically decided where Python's development is heading. So um, I want to, hi, Pablo. Hi. How are you doing? You're here. <laughs> Welcome to your Python. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yes, very nice of you to come and then to give your talk. So um, I don't want to take more of your time. So I would suggest that you um, you start the the screen share. The technicians put it up. Let's see. There you go. Right. And uh, I will stay around, but I will now leave the stage to you. Thank you, Pablo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. What? Well, well, okay. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I would like also to take the opportunity to thank the organizers. Like organizing a conference this big is uh, a lot of work. Um, I have organized two smaller conferences and I have uh, ended exhausted. So uh, kudos to all the organizers and you know like make sure to to say thank you uh, to them if you have the opportunity. Um, so, uh, and thank you for coming to, to this keynote. It's, it's a bit early in the morning, but um, let's see if uh, we can get something something interesting in these four to five minutes. Um, so this keynote is going to be a bit special. It's going to be a bit of a journey over like, you know, several aspects of um, how C Python is developed and like how how things work in core development. Um, but ideally, um, I would like also the keynote to be around an interesting idea that I had recently, and I I see this idea popping up everywhere. Um, so I would like it to share to share with you, and hopefully at the end of the talk, so you are a bit convinced of of uh, what I want to see. Okay, so just a, a few comments over like who I am because you know I'm going to talk for uh, 45 minutes. So you probably uh, want to know briefly why you should listen to me for five minutes, right? Um, so as Mark mentioned, uh, so I'm a C Python core developer for several years already. Uh, I'm in the Steering Council this year. Uh, the Steering Council is kind of this uh, this group of core devs and people from the community that kind of decides on um, like peps and like. Uh, high governance and things like that. I'm the Python 3.10 and 3.11 release manager. Uh, as you know, probably Python 3.10 is like months away. Uh, we are super excited. It's a, it's a fantastic release. Uh, we think it's going to be the, the best Python ever. It's going to be faster, has like super shiny feature like pattern matching, a bunch of very interesting stuff. Um, and in my daily work, I, I work in the Python infrastructure team at Bloomberg. Um, so we are we are actually sponsor of EuroPython. So you have the opportunity and go and say hello uh, into our digital booth or whatever it's called these days. Um, cool. Um, so one interesting thing is that before I worked, you know, on, on Python and, and you know computer science and, and whatnot, um, I used to uh, research um, black holes in academia. So. Uh, you know, like this may sound like why is this all black holes now, right? But but bear with me. It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting topic. So let, let me tell you about uh, just just briefly about black holes because I find them like super super interesting and it's actually quite very related to the the small story that I, I want to show you. So something that I used to do when I used to study these things is to produce this kind of simulation over how black hole will look like. Uh, very similar to the you know the, the the photo of the black hole that you probably already see. My simulations are a bit different. Like for instance, this is a simulation over how um, a particular uh, rotating black hole uh, distorts the, the the background. So you can see like the the dark part uh, over here is kind of the the event horizon, which is this region with light kind of escape. And you can see here like all this distortion around like the the the, the star field, right? Normally these things are are kind of surrounded by like like accretion disk, which is this kind of like super hot matter that is falling into it. Um, and it has like this super weird structure. I don't know if you have ever seen. Obviously this talk is not really about black holes, so I, I won't go into a lot of detail. Uh, but all of this thing here is kind of the accretion disk. Uh, it has the same thing as this one inside. Like it's literally the same disk. Um, like being distorted by light. If you kind of see it in a kind of, if you make the camera going around the black hole, 
um, to take like, you can also have like kind of better images, of course, than just this low res simulation. But if you just take the, the camera kind of like to look around the black hole, you can see how the kind of the disk inside here becomes the disk outside whoop, when it flips. It's, it's quite, quite interesting, right? Like there are these super interesting beasts that distort space time in, in quite a dramatic way, right? They, they create this kind of a space time storms, right? Okay, so, you know, like you could say, okay, so why black holes? So I, I want you to look at this picture. Uh, this is kind of one of the most interesting points of the top. So what you're seeing here is like a photo of from, I think it's 1997 until 2016 of the center of the galaxy. And if you see here, these this like bright dots that you see are stars. Um, obviously, you know, like the stars move quite, quite slow, like these distance are like, parsecs, right? Uh, but the interesting here that you can see is that, uh, for instance, if you if you look in this star, this star is cycling something. You see, it's going in circles like this, uh, but there is nothing in the middle. And this is basically the question of like, okay, so, okay, if black holes are black and they don't emit light, so how we know that they are there, right? And this case here, uh, as you can see, is, is a system, right? And this is going to become very in interesting in the talk. It's a system when uh, things are happening, right? You know, these bright stars are moving around, um, but it seems that whatever is driving the movement of these stars is invisible, right? Like we can see, for instance, as I mentioned, this one this is doing these circles, uh, but this is nothing here. There is not a bright star in the middle, right? Like if you don't see it clearly, there is this other kind of, you know, uh, image that is more um, like a schematic when you can see the movement of these stars. As you can see, all these stars kind of are cycling something which is in the middle, which is not there, right? Um, which is a mystery, right? Like uh, this is how one way that we use to detect black holes. Like when, when you have like these massive stars cycling around a single point, which is like black, um, then you can infer that something is there and then you can infer which is its mass and how much volume that uh, does the mass is uh, enclosing. And then you can kind of know, okay, so, so you know, th there is a black hole there, right? Um, you know, you may be a bit confused, like, why, why are you talking about this thing? But it's going to become quite interesting, uh, quite interesting on the talk, right? So another kind of interesting topic around like mysteries of, uh, you know, like, like physics and whatnot is, is, is what we call dark matter. So when we look at galaxies and then we see how fast these galaxies spin, like on different points of the disk, like for instance, we see how, how fast they spin close to the center and how fast they spin close to the edge. Um, so you can have this kind of plot, right? So this, this, this line over here is, is what we expect like the galaxy spins slower, the farther it is from the center. But it turns out that what we see is this line over here. It's kind of the galaxy spins more or less uh, at the same speed, which is super weird, right? And this is where it comes, like with the thing that we call dark matter comes from, right? Like if, you know, it's kind of a weird thing because it's like, we are basically saying, okay, so dark matter is something weird that instead of, you know, of producing this result, produce this result. If you don't have it clear, basically the, the game that we play is that if you have this this problem, like you have, you know, one plus one equals three and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, then you basically invent one extra number and then you call this dark number and then you are done. That's basically how physicists work, right? Like <laughs> that is basically what we call, right? So it's this entity that we don't know that is there. But the interesting thing is that this dark matter in the galaxies and the black holes in the images that you saw are kind of driving the whole behavior of the system, but they are invisible. You cannot see them, but it's one of the most important parts in the system, right? It's literally explaining how the system works. And this is going to become very important. Okay, so the question then is like, okay, so what has, you know, black holes related to Python or to C Python in particular, which is what this talk is about? Well, you could say that, you know, like both uh, will uh, absorb you if you are close enough and will probably tear your soul apart uh, in, a, you know, in a rip of a space time where not even like can, can escape. Um, but, you know, like, uh, obviously, obviously we are talking about two different things. Um, so what we are going to like go now is to different aspects of like, you know, CPython development and different interesting insights that happen while we are, you know, developing CPython. But we are trying to, you know, the same way I explained with this black hole and dark matter idea of like something visual that is driving the system. Um, I, I would like to kind of wrap around with all these stories. So all these, these stories will have something in common that hopefully we will see at the end. Um, but uh, maybe you, you will see the hints as we go. So the first like story or, or things that uh, I want to talk about is, is kind of 
the invisible, right? Like it's okay. Well, the same way black holes are invisible, there is there's things here that are invisible. Um, uh, but what is invisible in C Python development? So let me let me tell you a story. So this is something that happened on Twitter one day this year. So Anthony, for the ones that you don't know, Anthony is a great member of the Python community that works on like a lot of tools like Flake 8, uh, like he's also a Python score developer. Like he's a super uh, nice person. Uh, he tweeted this, this tweet, right? He said like, oh, you're getting this kind of nonsense syntax error on, on Python, right? Like horrible, horrible error. Um, you can try the PyPy project, right? Like PyPy, as you know, is this a, a faster alternative interpreter. It's, it's fantastic, you should try it out. But it turns out that he was complaining, that, you know, like C Python has these horrible error messages, while, while PyPy has a much better. And, you know, I, I look at this and say like, I mean, you know, challenge accepted, challenge accepted. Let me, let me, let me try to fix. And this tweet like was the, the start of like, one of the biggest uh, new developments on Python 3.10, which is kind of this this new error messages. So let me let me kind of show you a bit what is this around. So for instance, this is one of the problems that we have. Imagine that you have like a dictionary, right? And you have a bunch of numbers. And the problem is that this dictionary is not closed. It doesn't have a closing bracket. Uh, and then there is some other code afterwards. So it turns out that if you run this example of Python uh, on Python 3.9 or 3.8, uh, you will receive this thing, which is super weird, right? It's telling you that, that this this uh, this equal sign in the in the uh, some other code example uh, is invalid syntax, which kind of it is because you know it's thinking that it's inside the dictionary because it never saw it closed, but like this is super confusing, super confusing. So after some effort and you know uh, quite a lot of changes on the tokenizer of C Python, which is one of the oldest areas of the code base and it's very, very tricky as you can imagine. One cool thing that we have now in Python 3.10, the same as PyPy has as well, uh, is that now we can uh, finally, <laughs> we can finally point you in this particular example that the problem is not like, you know, the, there is there is an equal sign that is scoring correctly, is that this this open bracket was was never closed. Um, this seems like a, you know, a very simple thing, right? Like, but this is, this is super important because even like experienced developers who know when this normally can happen, uh, you know, they're trip and, you know, this, this is, this is fantastic. And this is, this was actually not super, super easy to implement in our particular tokenizer just because the error happened after we pass over these lines, but we are super excited to have this thing the same way uh, as the Piper interpreter has and, and some others. And this is one of the examples, right? And then, you know, then I say, oh, uh, you know, I saw these two people and people were like, wow, well, finally, like, you know, this is this is something that we all wanted, like, this is fantastic. And this this made me think like, okay, so we may be onto something, right? Like maybe, maybe you know, people want the speed and, you know, people want like, you know, new features and like pattern matching and whatnot, but but maybe maybe this is something that also people want, this, this better error messages, right? So it turns out that recently I've been working with Guido and Lisandros on uh, the new perk parser which uh, is the kind of uh, this new parser for Python um, that we introduced in Python 3.9. Um, there is two talks about this parser on this conference. I'm quite excited to see them. Um, so so I, I will be there. I encourage you to check them. Um, but the idea is that now this parser is quite more powerful than the one before. And one thing that I've been uh, doing, uh, transforming and working with it recently on Python 3.10 is to make it like much smarter regarding error messages and error reporting, which is a bit complicated in PEC because because PEC doesn't have the concept of a failure, uh, but we have pulled it out and I'm quite happy. Let me, I want to show you some of the examples that we have made. So for instance, uh, one thing that we do now is that when there is a syntax error, we highlight now the whole range. So instead of like just pointing to set, we point to the whole thing. So in this example, it's a function call with the generator without parentheses. So we tell you all the things that are wrong here, which is quite cool before we only show you one of the, of the carrots. Uh, something that we do as well is that, you know, if you do a conditional with only one equal here, so if something equals something, uh, instead of telling you, you know, like, well, generic invalid syntax, we tell you like, okay, so, you know, maybe you mean like equal equals instead of one equals, uh, which is quite cool as well. For instance, this is one of my favorites. Like if you have a, a dictionary or a list or something and you're missing here, you're missing a comma, uh, then the interpreter will tell you, oh, oh maybe you're missing a comma here, right? Which is quite cool instead of complaining to the next line. Um, so more things that we do, which is quite exciting. Like if you type uh, an attribute of a module or a class or basically of anything else, uh, but that is not there, then Python will try to be helpful and tell you like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe instead of name tuple that doesn't exist, you mean name tuple. 
um, so which is quite cool. This also works with local um, local variables. Like you know, I, I was never <laughs> probably many of you are from Germany, so you probably can pronounce Schwarzschild much better than me. Uh, what a cool name, right? Like Schwarzschild is uh, is one of the guys who discovered one of the simplest battles. It means black shield. Uh, I would like to have like one surname as cool as as, as this guy, uh, but I I never remember how to spell it. Uh, and in this case, you for instance, if you use you know you use the variable, it will tell you. Well, I don't have any variable with this spelling, but maybe you mean this other one, which you know we, we are super excited to um, to see. And these are super cool, right? Um, so so you know we we keep adding these things, and then you know people keep reacting like super well and say like oh maybe we are onto something. Like it seems that people really 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 value UX experience and better error messages, and this leads us to pip six five seven, which is a Python three eleven. Uh, it's not on it's not on Python three ten, uh, but this is uh, a work that we did with um, Amar and Batuhan Teskaya. And the idea here is that now uh, in, in the interpreter will tell you exactly uh, where errors happen in a line. Uh, so for instance, here, if there is some problem because one of these values is known, it will tell you that the problem is in this part of the expression, right? So th this operation is the one that is wrong. And um, which is right because before it was like super, like imagine that you don't have these lines over here telling you exactly what's going on. Uh, it will be super difficult to know exactly what's happening, right? And for instance, uh, if it's known, there is other other kind of things. So you know, I tweeted this thing and I announced that we have this thing, and you know, we had this like fantastic response from the community, like like super engaging. Like it turns out that everybody likes this thing. Like is 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 this like? I've been working on so many features of C Python. Like I've been working on like some of the speed improvements on Python three ten and eleven. Uh, some of the new features. Um, you know some some of the typing stuff, but it turns out that that UX experience is this thing that turns out that you know like everybody really really likes. I mean, obviously you you can imagine that like people like UX, right? Like obviously, uh, why do you want uh, like better error messages? But like I was not expecting this kind of response. This is this is one of the examples, right? Like is this this, this mysterious um, like you know hidden item that people don't prioritize when they talk about why they want in Python. Normally they say, oh yeah, I want a faster Python, right? Or I want like, you know, type annotations to do something or I want like pattern matching. But they, they don't normally discuss the things even if they really, really want them, right? So this is like the invisible thing that is driving the system. Like maybe what like make people excited about Python 3.10 uh, is not that much pattern matching. Maybe what makes people excited about Python 310 is also uh, obviously pattern matching is exciting. But you know, maybe it's also also the error messages, right? So, so this is an interesting thing to think about. Like, is there any other um, like aspects that people want that are hidden? Like, there is any more black holes here that we don't see and is driving the whole system of what people like in Python? So this is something that you know is is making me think a lot recently, and and it's one of the stories that I wanted to share with you, uh, like how important this this aspect is. Um, you know, which, which sounds cool, but it turns out that nothing is that simple, right? Because you know, like okay, so implement better messages. Um, so you know. If if you look at how I was while I was implementing these new error messages, because you know we we needed to modify the pack parser to do this thing, and the the pack parser is 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 using pack, which is not a, not a especially good like parsing mechanism for making error messages because it doesn't have a super clear concept of error, although you know you can do it. There is a lot of research about this thing. So basically, this this was my uh, this was myself and the pack parser, right? Like the, the fingers here are obviously bugs. And I was trying to smash all the bugs. And the problem is that every time you know, like uh, you implement some new error messages, then the other fail, and you know, it's it's quite quite ridiculous. So let me let me share one of the weirdest bugs I, I have seen while I was developing these these better error messages. Probably the weirdest one has been this one. So I typed the same code in the repo three times, this stupid for loop, which is totally valid, and the third time the parser says that it's invalid syntax. So it's like it's like a <laughs> like a quantum parser, right? Like something like that. The 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 for loop is in a superposition of valid syntax and invalid syntax, and only when you look, it, it will collapse to one of the or either state. This was super ridiculous to find out uh, because you know, like it's a it's a for loop that sometimes is invalid, sometimes it's not, right? And you know, this this took a lot of time because because this is one of the kind of bugs that happen after the fact. Uh, like it's not it's not like you know the bug happens and then something goes wrong. Like the, it's something like you know the bug happens and then it goes through all the interpreter like you know like all the way through the compiler pipeline 
Um, and at the end of the day, uh, turns out that you know you, you get just invalid syntax, not a check fault, not um, not a crash, nothing. It's just invalid syntax. So, so what what is going on here? Like what what, what has happened? So it turns out that um, when the parser constructs the abstract syntax tree, which is this tree that basically encodes uh, before going to the compiler, it encodes the shape of your of your program in a lexical uh, in a in le lexical way. So basically, like for loop, and maybe this this is the target of the for loop, and etc. So in C Python, the C in C Python is in, is C, right? The C language, right? So C Python is implemented in C. And in C, we have kind of this, this specific um, class, basically, right? This is track. And we use this thing to store a collection of something, right? So, you know, like it has this size parameter here, which is how many elements do we have? And then we have this array of elements, uh, of void star elements. And then we have, uh, you know, a bunch of like macros here uh, just to get maybe an element. Uh, then we have another to set an element, and then we have another to tell us like what is the length of the sequence. The problem is that this thing is super generic. Like you can store absolutely whatever. Like you can store like like you know donuts, integers, flows, whatever you want, and you won't know what you have a store because the parameter is boy star, which basically means whatever. Like you know the C doesn't care. So the problem is that we were inserting into one of these things something and then we were retrieving it as if it was something else so imagine that you put into a box an orange and then you know i don't know you close your eyes and then you retrieve the orange and you pretend that it's an apple i mean it's not going to be like super super you know apple right when you try to to bite it down right so this was the problem it was basically memory corruption uh, so when we were doing this thing, we were corrupting the memory, but it was valid memory. So nothing was wrong from the perspective of the C programming language. Um, but the problem is that, you know, like uh, the memory was getting corrupted. It was surviving the whole interpreter. Uh, it's just that like when when uh, it goes to to um, the, the time of parsing the for, uh, the for loop, uh, then it is it's basically not recognizing, the, the peck parser was not recognizing the for loop because uh, one, um, one item that should not have been zero, it was zero just because we were corrupting this memory. So the way we solve this thing is that we, I mean, obviously a more strong language uh, like C++ or Rust or, or something like that will have generics, which is how you solve this problem. Them. But in C, kind of, you don't have any of this. So the, the way we solve this thing is kind of like trying to, you know, make this thing even more complex. And now we have this this cool kind of sequences that you know it, it has types here. So for instance, you can have like now, uh, okay, so you have an array of of Python objects, and then there is kind of this this crazy call here now that, that is able to allow you to work with with type information, which is still like you know too complicated because we are re-implementing generics in C. Um, but but it's safer now. Now these kind of bugs will not happen, right? So so. But this was super super tricky to find out, right? Like we we needed to you know think about like how this could happen uh, and you know like like check all the memory that was involved into these calculations. So you know um, I don't know if you have seen this kind of like 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 table about like you know like. Um, uh, there is a name in English I, I never remember for this thing, alignment, right? The alignment charts for from D and D, right? So you know, like people put here programming languages, maybe they say, okay, Python maybe is lawful good, and uh, I don't know, Java is lawful evil. I mean, uh, you know, like all programming languages are useful, so uh, this is obviously a joke. But something that I'm super sure is that C is here. Like, you know, you, you kind of convince me. Like, if you program in C and I do, like, it's chaotic evil. So that, that's how it is, right? Like, C is just like a foot gun pointed to both your feet at the same time. It's a quantum foot. Um, so C is bad. That's the conclusion. <laughs> don't, don't call in C if you can avoid it. Um, but let me tell you about other cool stories and, and bugs. Like um, one interesting thing about the bugging is, is, is this um, this sentence by uh, Nicolas Negroponte that says like programming allows you to think about thinking, and while you debugging, you are learning. Um, you, are, you learn to learning, right? And the idea here is quite interesting because you know like uh, you you need to you need to be a bit smarter than you were when you write the code, and when you learn, you are putting your assumptions to test. So the bugging is probably one of the most important tasks as a programmer. That you need to do right uh, because you need to you need to have basically everything that you learn and then you understand to the system and almost by definition something will be wrong uh, so it's a fantastic way to condense and check, uh, very scientific as well, right? Because you do these little experiments and whatnot. Um, so I, I, I really like the bugging, not that much because of the sensation, because you know it's always frustrating and bugs are, are kind of hard and whatnot. 
uh, but but it really 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 puts all your knowledge of the system to test and it allows you to identify things faster it allows you to be a bit humble because it's kind of you need to fight yourself because you're going to be wrong like that's that's why the bugging if you have a bug is like there is something that you didn't understood um so so you need to fight yourself a bit and, and that's a super interesting thing right like i mean systems like c python it can be a bit complex because you know like the bugs can be super complex bugs from outer space uh, but, I, but i think it's, it's, it's one of the best activities that you can do to learn as a programmer let me tell you about some other weird bug that happened so for instance this is a bug that happened on the c python test suite we we have this kind of comparison checker class that takes kind of an object and every time it compares equals to something it adds one to this comparison uh, field so basically it counts how many times this object was compared and then in the python test suite we have this 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 kind of test when we were creating like like some other object this could be a string or something like that and then we were compare, like creating this comparison checker over a string. So the comparison checker will check how many times this string was compared to. And then we create this dictionary with both things as keys. Uh, then we check if the comparison checker with the same string is in X, and then we check how many comparisons, right? Like this, this thing over here should have created one comparison only because you know it's, it's comparing against a string. Um, but it turns out that this was failing sometimes, only sometimes, uh, which was super, super annoying. Um, like it took us several hours to understand what was going on because you know, like this thing was created only to be compared once and it has been working for years without nobody touching this code. And suddenly one afternoon it crashes uh, with like, more than one comparison so so you know like this was quite hard because you, you need to understand exactly how not only how the dictionary is implemented but also all the possibilities that can happen there like for experienced python developers you probably know what's going on uh what's going on is that you know like um they, this thing can have a hash collision in the dictionary and then it will compare more times like one way to force a hash collision here is to basically make the other object that we were discussing has the same hash as the string uh, and here, what will happen is that once you add it here, then both A and B will be on the same bucket inside the dictionary because they will have uh, the same hash, but they will not be equal. So when you check if the comparison checker is in X, then it will compare first to B and then to A. So the comparisons are not one or two. But how did this happen? Like why this was working under, until one day? So it turns out that the strings in C Python uh, has the hash been randomized. So, so the hash of the string changes every time you open the interpreter. With, with the bad luck, that this some other object here that we had, which was just another string maybe, or, or I don't know what it was, but like a method, a function or something like that. So the, the bad luck was that that thing had a hash only on that execution of the test suite that was colliding for the first time in years with the other string that we were testing. And for the first time in years, the number of comparison was not one. Uh, it tells you like something about writing good tests and um, you know like uh, probably this was an oversight but you know debugging this thing was quite weird because you, you are expecting to see something like threats and like you know it's a race condition only happens sometimes but this was just a plain dictionary it's some it looked like super deterministic uh, but it turns out that it, it was not that that deterministic right like you know it can be it can be hard you need to when you're debugging things especially in C python you need to be uh thoughtful of what's going on um, let me then go to some some other event here. So um, so the, the idea here that that you know some insights on the bugging is that um, one, one interesting thing that you can do when you are started to debug something that you really don't understand, like you know think about these um, super complex bugs that you see that where no, nothing like seems to make sense. Uh, so so one, one idea here that I normally do when I debug is that, um, so I try to be modular. The idea here is that you don't try to change uh, multiple things at the same time, right? Like, you know, just do very, very small things, almost like, you know, like the scientific method, like to do a little experiment, you see what happens. But if you start to change like multiple things at the same time, even if it's very tempting, because, you know, maybe you're changing like an equal equals and a less than or something like that because you think both are wrong. Try to do one by one and see what happens because otherwise you're going to you're going to probably uh, be in nonlinear behavior and you really, really want to see like the effects of everything that you think is independent. So, you know, take your time. Debugging is a task that, you know, takes it some time. Uh, and if you try to rush it, you probably, you know, will will uh, not be able to succeed very well. So, you know, try, try to do these little changes. Another interesting thing is that, you know, check your assumption. And the idea here is that, um, one of the most cool things that I normally do here is to bring to the problem someone who has never worked with that part of the code base, like in C Python 
or maybe also like you know if you are debugging your company or your own code so try to try because these people have superpowers right like these people will see the system for the first time so you won't have your biases that you have towards it right they will tell you like oh yeah but this thing that you say uh, it doesn't make sense right maybe you do you have the thing already integrated and then you say yeah this is this way right but maybe these people will tell you i, I don't understand like what this is this way right um, then the, the next thing is like, you know, try to break, break down the thing, right? Like the idea is that there is some super mysterious thing, right? Like uh, if you remember this, this, this mysterious things that are driving the back, maybe they are not the back, but they are driving the back. This is what makes the back happen. This is the black hole of the bagging, right? It's the mysterious invisible force that is dominating the system, but nobody sees. So the idea is that you don't, you don't go, you know, head on towards the black hole. That is a bad idea, right? It's going to, it's going to, uh, trapped you forever. So you need to kind of break it down, right? Like you, you, you start saying like, okay, so what is the next thing that I don't understand? Like, can I, can I do like a small experiment to understand what's going on? And like, you know, it's not a super smart, like advice because probably you're already doing it, but like, you know, try, try to always think about like small problems. Don't try to like, like, you know, uh, grab the, the big problem all ahead. And the, the, the next like advice is like this lay hypothesis, like try to not make a hypothesis at the beginning of the, of the, the, of the problem, because then you're going to go into confirmation bias. Like you're going to say, uh, you think, oh, I think this is what is happening. And if you don't have any, en enough like information, then what's going to happen is that every, every behavior that you see from the system, you're going to try to justify towards your hypothesis, right? And maybe what happens is that you are convinced enough, which is one of the most dangerous state to be in. And then what you end doing is like you implement this part fixes or hacks right just because you are convinced enough and then you say oh, this seems to fix the problem or even i don't understand why so let's go ahead right um so you know this is like a small advice that i have learned over the years of the vacancy python and i think it would be interesting for you let me tell you about another cool thing right like J julia evans has a lot of discussions um on the bugging and, and she has this a fantastic sentence that says like she loves the bugging bugs because you know uh it means that you're going to learn something new which is something i always say when i have like some super weird bug happening like uh, it means that i have not understood something on my system or on cpython and i'm going to learn something new so you know like at least you have that that to um to have in mind while you debug the, the bug but let me tell you some some uh one of the funniest bugs that we have in cpython is is this BPO thirty four something something right? So this 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 bug over here is some some bug on on FreeBSD. Um, so this bug took like six days to solve just because we needed to like go through to an RFC and find out like you know like like how the network layer like was supposed to behave. We needed to understand like you know how the, the packets were able to behave on different Linux systems. We found this sentence on some forgotten page of the RFC that says that uh, or portable applications like applications that can be making different operating system needs to be uh, providing some particular thing. So after six days, this was the PR. It was like a one line change. This is six days of the bug, right? Like just, just to show you that this, this, this can happen when you are doing something as, as complex as like networking. But probably my favorite bug in CPython is this one. It's BPO 37213. Pip hole optimizer does not optimize functions with multiple expressions. Uh, but I like to call this bug how a bug in CPython made call formatted with the black format that is lower. So let me tell you all the problem. So imagine you have this list comprehension. You have this x for x in iterable if x, right? This is the bytecode it generates, right? It, it's going to build a list. It loads uh, like the iterable that we store in this secret variable called dot zero. And then it loads the x to see if it's, if it's true or not. And if it's true, it goes to false to the next item. And if it's not true, uh, it, it loads the X and appends it to the list, right? And then it jumps to the next one. Uh, if you see here, there is two jumps here. There is the jump in number 10 and the jump in number 16. Both jump to the next one on number four, right? So, so you know, when both jumps will go to the, to the same place. But if you break the list comprehension in two lines or three lines, then the bytecode is mysteriously different. And the difference is that this jump over here instead of going directly to four, which is the next item in the list comprehension, it goes to 16, which is another jump, then, then, then goes to four, which means that instead of like, you know, when, when it sees that there is an item here in this iterable that is false, instead of going directly to the next item, it goes to another bytecode that then they goes to the four iter. This is called like jump elimination when this doesn't happen, but it turns out that we weren't doing this thing 
uh, with, uh, with, with a certain kind of code, right? A certain kind of jumps. And the interesting thing here is that, you know, like <laughs> this is just another bytecode, but if you have a super big least comprehension of a loop, this can make your program slower. And, you know, think about a tool that converts very long lines, uh, leading comprehension in one line into uh, like, you know, like, like comprehensions spawning multiple lines. So basically because the code in the bottom was slower due to this bug. So black could have been seen as the de-optimizer. <laughs> like it was, it was formatting your code and making it more beautiful, but also making it slower. Uh, obviously the bug is fixed and black is not doing that thing anymore. But I always find it very funny that that black was basically the first Python an optimizer. Um, you know, interesting thing. So le le let's go to the to the kind of like the last like interesting insight that I have. So this this revolves to a story that I, I I saw one day when when you know like in some Python meetup in Spain, and uh, the idea is that uh, it was this uh, this uh, person that was confused by a Python idiom. So this is the Python idiom. This person was confused because this person came from C or from Java or like who knows, right? And the idea here is that, you know, they were seeing this code to swap variables, you know, x comma y equals y comma x, which we all, you know, we all like code in Python, we love and we understand and is one of the most expressive things in the language. Uh, but maybe not one of them, but like, you know, it's a very expressive thing. And, but this, this, this person was like super confused, like why there is not a temporary variable? Like how does this even work? Because in C or in Java or whatever this person was coding before, uh, this person was used to have like a temporary variable that was swapping both, right? Like, and, and the answer to the person like that this guy was asking, like, why is this happening? It was like, what's going on here is tuple unpacking. And that was the explanation, it's tuple unpacking. And, and you know, the person obviously that didn't understood the code uh, so was was given the, the answer and the answer is tuple unpacking. And you know, like that is my, my point here and the whole, the whole thing that I wanted to teach you here is that tuple unpacking was the horriblest answer in the world. Why is this? Because like, what is even tuple unpacking, right? Like you have a person who is, who is not asking a question of like, you know, like how is, how is this called? It's not how is this called, it's like, how is this possible? And you know, this person have uh, like, is the, the question is hinting like, okay, so, so how is this implemented? Because in my language in C or Java or whatever, I need a temporary variable and here I don't need a temporary variable. And you know, if you throw like a, a word and this happens, you know, to a lot of us, right? Like you, you are maybe on your, or asking some of your colleges or like, you know, some person and they give you this like, like, you know, like names, right? And super complex names. And that is the explanation. This is a blue, blue, blue. And like, you know, that is a, not a cool answer. And the reason is because this is stopping you from going deeper, like to understand what's going on. So if this person who didn't understood like X comma Y equal Y comma X, instead of like, you know, receiving tuple and packing as an answer, that person will have like going deeper and say, okay, so I have like this code. Uh, so what happens with this code? Like what, 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 what is going on? Is like the question is, okay, so, so, so this is like Python code, which is obviously going to be translated into bytecode and it's going to be executed on C Python. C Python is C and in C you need a temporary variable to do something like this. So the question, one interesting question that you can actually answer, uh, uh, ask yourself is like, is there a temporary variable being used by CPython here internally? Like a magic thing, right? Like for us, CPython does this, this nice thing. Um, so it's a, it's a temporary variable or not? And that is a super interesting question. So let, let's try to find out. So when you do this code, it executes to bytecode, right? And the bytecode instruction for this particular operation is a, 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 a operation called rot to, which means rotate to which is basically like, you know, swap X and Y. So let's see, uh, you know, how that will look like. Of course, like in C, you will do this thing, right? Like you will have like uh, w like X, X uh, and Y. And, you know, if you want to put X where Y is, you will need like a temporary variable. So I'll say, okay, let me save the state of X in my temporary, then let me assign to Y and then let me recover Y. This is what the person was expecting to. But this is, this is like the question is like, is C Python doing something like this internally? Yes, no, Let, let's see what's going on. So what's going on, you know, like when you like check the bytecode of this, you will see that the bytecode is, is like, you load the variable X, you load, sorry, the variable Y, you load the variable X, then you execute this mysterious instruction called rot rot two, like, you know, rotate two, and then you store X and then you store Y, right? So it's kind of like, you, there's some mysterious rotation and then you do some stores. So it's like, is, is this rotation on these two stores using a temporary? So let's see, let's see how these two are, are implemented. So this is the, the C code for row two. So you see, it's super easy. What you do here, 
is that you take one uh, one object from the top of your stack, then you take another object from the top of your stack, and then you put them in the stack in the opposite order. There is not a temporary variable. I mean, you could consider that these locals here could be temporary variables, but they are not in the same sense as this temporary variable that we need in the other example, right? You could store the thing on the stack itself, so you don't need C temporary variables, or, and actually, if you check if you check the assembly, this is actually going to be stored in register. So there is no temporary variables per se, right? I mean, you could also argue that in the, in the temporary variable in C is going to be a register there, but my point here is that here, a confusion over like, you know, how the swap works shows you something much, much more interesting, which is that the execution model is different. The execution model here is a stack. What you have is a stack with the variable, like, you know, if you have never seen this thing, it's quite confusing, but you know, you can, you can Google it, right? What you have is a stack and then you have like the variables there and to just swap two variables on my stack, I just pull them from the stack both, like I take the top and the, and the second, and then I put them in the stack in the opposite order. And that basically swaps the thing. Like in, if instead of X plus Y, I want to do Y plus X, I will take X, I will take Y, and then I will put Y and then I will put X and or the other way, right? And the, the idea here is that, that this is a much more interesting thing. If this person that was confused by the double unpacking answer will have like go a bit deeper and it's like, so so why I'm confused? Like, why is the thing that I don't understand? What is the, the black hole in this system? The invisible thing that is driving the whole thing? It will have understood that, you know, like there is a, a new thing that maybe you didn't know that is that C Python in particular is using a stack machine as a, as a you know, as a execution model. You could also keep going deeper. There is like deeper as much as you want. You could say, okay, so this is C, uh, but what happens like when this C is compiled to assembly? So what happens is this thing, this is the assembly code that is being generated, which is like, it's like a bunch of moves, right? Like if you check what's going on is that the, every two moves is basically one of these instructions here. And what you see here is that all of these are basically using like, like two registers, right? Plus offset, right? It's using the RBP register and the RAX register. You don't need to understand this code. The point here is that uh, what you need to know here is that, you know, assembly is a register based machine, which also has a stack. So, so you could also say like, okay, so, so you know, my code uh, that swaps two variables, which is implemented in Python is transformed to bytecode, which is derived by C using a stack. That's why I don't need a temporary variable. Uh, but then you could say there is a temporary variable in the C code, and then you check, okay, so that is actually, that is translated then to assembly, and is this this bunch of move instruction, which is just the move instruction is basically moving things from memory. Although you know, it turns out that this thing is too incomplete, by the way. Like you can absolutely do a compiler that only emits move instructions. Some some person has done that actually. It's called the Mofuscator. It's quite crazy, like how powerful just moving things in memory can be. Um, so in particular, this code is just like a bunch of move instructions. Um, but then you can you can discuss like okay, so you know there is a temporary here, and in terms of there is another execution model which is totally different here, which is you know like a register stack machine, and you could think that the register is temporary or not. So it's now up to you to decide if at the end of the day it was or not a temporary variable. But you know a person who have the time to go deeper and like you know maybe ask questions to people and understood, it will have discovered all this beauty, right? All these execution models. Like I you know you have seen this meme, but um, is the is the like the Python programmers saying like okay so it's x plus y all an abstraction and you know like like c plus plus and everyone's like yeah always has been right and maybe you can even go to transistors if you have like some 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 time or a uh, uh, physics or electrical engineering um, you know. Um, it's interesting. You can keep going, but like going deeper is, is something fantastic because it's something that uh, will tell you. Um, uh, like like the behavior of your system, right? Um, so so I wanted to finish just just the talk, right? And the idea here is that in the same way, you know, the the, the black hole was was the mysterious thing, and the dark matter here was the mysterious thing driving the whole system of these stars. These these examples that I showed you are things that you know are hidden um, at the beginning, uh, but they are driving the whole thing. And this is the thing that you need to do, right? Like you need to you need to seek the dark matter in all these examples to to have a better understanding. Um, and I think you will be a much better um, professional and a much better uh, engineer if, if you do this thing and you seek these invisible forces, right? And that's, I think, I, I hope I have not uh, burned a lot of extra time. Uh, so that's the that's, uh, finish of my talk. I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Pablo. That was an excellent talk. <laughs> very exciting, very, very deep as well. Um, unfortunately, we, we are running out of time, so we cannot ask, answer any questions. Uh, in this uh, main room, 
but I would suggest that you perhaps go to the breakout room Optiver um, mm -hmm. on Matrix, and then you can you can you know answer questions there. I'm going to copy the the questions uh, that I collected uh, to that room, and then you can have a look there. So everyone is very excited. Uh, you're getting a nice applause. Thank you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're kind of trying to simulate everything, right? That, that is so, very needed in these times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I very much enjoyed your talk. Thank you for, for uh, coming to the conference. Thank you for the keynote. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. So Thank you a lot we for having me. We will now have a short break, and then um, we will head on to the next session. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.